And, uh, and the fact is that Miliband and Ball thus far have said quite categorically they do accept capitalism. They, they've said very, uh, with no uncertain terms, we're, we're, we defend the capitalist system. We're, we're not uh, out to, to change it fundamentally. We want to just make it responsible and so forth. But unfortunately, if you, you know, like I said, if you accept capitalism, you accept the logic of it. If you want responsible capitalism, the only thing you're going to end up with is being responsible for making cuts. And, uh, and I think even Balls and Miliband actually really understand this, which is why you're hearing underneath all the promises, at the end of the day, the real uh, punchline is that they're promising balanced budgets, uh, they're, they're promising to not basically reverse any of the Tory cuts, and, uh, and any of the small gains that they offer with one hand, they're basically going to have to take away much more with the other. It's notable, actually, that the, uh, the promises they do offer uh, don't actually cost anything. They're talking about looking at the living wage, but how? By funding it through tax breaks for, the, for big business. They're talking about breaking up the banks. They're talking about an energy price freeze. None of these things that would actually cost any additional money because they understand that the cupboard is bare. They understand that at this time of crisis, there is nothing really to offer in terms of genuine reforms for ordinary people. And that any real reform that you were going to offer that actually made an impact on living standards would actually mean biting into the profits of capitalists. It would mean actually fundamentally struggling and, uh, and making the capitalists pay for the crisis, making the rich pay. Now, I want to emphasize, of course, uh, Marxists in the Labour Party uh, welcome the, uh, the, the shift to the left that we've seen by Miliband and his rhetoric and so forth over the last uh, year. Um, but as true friends, we must also be critical. A true friend isn't someone who tells you you look lovely when actually having a horrible day. A true friend is someone who tells you honestly when you're making a mistake so that you can correct it in due course. And in this sense, we need to be honest and tell the truth, which is that you know, for all the good intentions of these, uh, of these latest promises that are being offered, they're, they're going to end in disaster if, they, uh, if the party carries on in the way it's going. The, these so-called responsible reforms will end up in a disaster and will actually have the opposite effect from what they're intended. We already see this with the question of the energy price freeze. What's happened? Well, actually, far from energy prices being frozen, the companies are now talking about raising them. So actually, it's going to end up with an even worse situation for ordinary working people. We, we hear about you know, tax increase, and now what's the result of that? A threat of strike of capital, a strike of investment, the rich taking their money out of the, out of the country. So, we see Miliband has very good intentions, no one doubts that. But the point is, the road to hell, as they say, is paved with good intentions. The problem is, you can't control effectively what you don't own. And under capitalism, therefore, it's not the government that dictates to the economy, it's the economy that dictates the government. That's what we've really learned from looking at the Eurozone in the past uh, few years. That it's the financial markets that are dictating the policies uh, to governments, not the other way around. What you've ended up with is a dictatorship, really. But a dictatorship of bankers, a dictatorship of the IMF, the ECB, and so forth. The dictatorship of the financial markets that force the same policy of austerity on government after government. But yet, we see this massive contradiction because alongside being told that we need austerity, we see enormous amounts of wealth in society, but just wealth that's concentrated in very few hands. As many of you would have seen the reports the other day, which also on the, uh, the front page of this month's Socialist Appeal, about 85 billionaires that have as much wealth as half the world's population. It led to the Daily Mash satirically saying, 85 people own half the world's population. And that's effectively what we have under capitalism worldwide. And it's the same here in Britain. There's, uh, there's 800 billion pounds sitting idly in cash in the bank accounts of the biggest businesses here in Britain. You can find similar figures for America and for Europe as well. In other words, the big businesses here, the capitalists here in Britain, are sitting on an enormous pile of wealth that they refuse to invest. Why? Because they can't make a profit out of it. We, as, 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 as Marxists, as socialists, all we demand is that this wealth should be put under public ownership, that we should nationalise the banks, rather than Ed Miliband's promise to break up the banks and create lots of new banks and so forth. Why should we be doing that? We should be nationalising these banks, putting them under democratic control, putting them under public ownership, with a management that actually represents ordinary people, not the same old bankers and bosses that used to be there in the past, and using all of this wealth that's there in society 
um, to actually benefit the interests of society and not the interests of profit. Now, many people will say this is utopian or extremist, but I would say, really, actually, our demands are very reasonable and actually very pragmatic. You know, we are, we're, we're very reasonable. We have the same demands, really, as Ed Miliband, in the sense of, yes, a living wage for all, a uh, house for all, a job for all. Like, these are very reasonable demands. Free healthcare, free education, yes, all of these things. These aren't utopian at all. The utopian thing is, is thinking that capitalism in this day and age can actually provide these very basic demands. Therefore, we have to demand something a lot more, which is, as I say, the, the public ownership of, these, of this world. This is, we see, you know, un, at the moment, these enormous contradictions, really, in society. On the one hand, empty homes. You know, the, another report in The Guardian the other day showing that this street in London has something like 130 rooms just lying idle, these mansions owned by millionaires that are just used as speculative investments. And yet, alongside that, we have homelessness. I mean, that makes no sense, and yet that's the logic of, of this system. We see unemployed people, a mass unemployment, alongside people working 50 or 60 hours a week. Again, why isn't this work shared out and everyone working less? We see there's 800 billion sitting in the banks, and yet plenty of things that need to be produced. This is all uh, you know, reflections of the contradictions that capitalism finds itself in. And really, one of the biggest contradictions is that at a time when capitalism is really dying on its feet, when it's stumbling around from crisis to crisis, at this very time, you have Ed Miliband and Ed, and Ed Balls actually clinging to this cadaver of capitalism uh, and saying they're going to keep it alive as much as they can. Now, therefore, the policy that, that, that we think the Labour Party should be uh, running on is a socialist program, a bold socialist program, that, that tries to actually tackle these problems by tackling the root cause of the crisis. Now, there'll be those, I'm sure, and possibly even my fellow uh, comrades on the table here, who will make a hue and a cry saying that, you know, this will be, make us unelectable. You know, that's the key thing. We should shush what we really believe in as socialists, you know, but we should actually uh, make sure that we, uh, that we get elected, first of all, because once we're elected, then we can really do what we want. And, uh, you know, you'll hear all sorts of references in, the, in this regard to, to 1983 and the, uh, and the longest suicide note in history and so forth. Now, um, first of all, not to go back over, uh, over 1983 too much, but I always find it a contradiction that at the same time as people talked about the longest suicide note in history, you actually had socialist uh, MPs elected on enormous majorities on a socialist uh, uh, program in their constituencies uh, and during that same election. So we should be careful about this whole uh, idea of you know, it being left-wing that makes us unelectable. But even historically, uh, if that might be the case, let's look at the facts now. All the polls actually show that people are far to the left, actually, of the current Labour leadership and their policies. And uh, let me just about a few figures, for example. Well, first of all, what was the most popular uh, YouTube video of the last year? Anyone know? I'll give you a clue. He spoke earlier at the end of the year. Russell Brand, Call for Revolution, it had millions of hits on the internet. Why? Because it actually chimed with how ordinary people are feeling. That yes, that, that, that all the politicians are just the same people at the moment. That all these people in the Houses of Parliament don't really represent what ordinary people are going through. And, uh, and he gained an enormous echo. I would disagree with him on one important point, which is that yes, you should vote. Don't, don't abstain. Do vote. And I would encourage you to vote Labour. Keep the Tories out. But don't just vote. Get involved in politics. Fight for the programme that, uh, that we need. Well, let me just show you some of the other latest polls. Um, one one uh, conducted by uh, YouGov, where they asked uh, people about the, the support for nationalisation and so forth. Um, what, what statistics do we have here? 66% uh, said they support the nationalisation of the railways, something that isn't in the Labour manifesto. 68% support the nationalisation of the energy companies. So in fact, whilst L Miliband and co are talking about energy price freezes, the vast majority of people are actually supporting measures far to the left, actual nationalisation of these energy companies. There's public support for the public ownership of the Royal Mail and of the banks. Remarkably, even the majority of Tory voters actually support some of these measures on, in terms of public ownership of the railways and the energy companies. Um, 
there's a, there's a nice, well, just a, just a quote actually. This isn't a Marxist source or a socialist source. The International Business Times, hardly a left friendly newspaper, says that if David Cameron genuinely believes Red Ed Miliband is a socialist, then a new poll suggesting the public are far to the left of Labour and want state control of key sectors of the economy will be enough to provoke nightmares of a Marxist revolution in Downing Street. This is what's a Marxist revolution. Later on, the findings will come as a genuine shock to politicians on all sides as they suggest the public is demanding far more radical left-wing action to control the economy and utilities than any of the big parties are currently offering. Again, another article in City AM, very much the voice of, uh, of the city and of the finance industry, again, hardly a friend of the left. <coughs> On some economic issues, the public is far more left-wing than the Tories realise or that Labour can believe. And they go on to quote all the same, uh, all the same statistics. Supporters of a market economy have a very big problem. Unless they address the concerns of the public, they will be annihilated. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, because if the financial papers of big business acknowledge the radicalisation of society, then why are we as the Labour Party so afraid of embracing that same radicalisation? Why are we lagging behind actually the mood of ordinary people and promising measures that are far more conservative than what the polls and the figures show would decisively win an election if it was implemented? Alongside of this, we see not just words and polls, but we see action on the streets. We see sector after sector taking strike action against austerity. We see, uh, we see the Royal Mail workers, the, uh, the tube strike workers, we see the lecturers, the teachers, all of these have come out on strike recently. And what have Labour done? They haven't supported these strikes. In fact, our very own uh, shadow front bench are crossing picket lines to deliver lectures about Marxism. I mean, it's a farcical situation. We should be out supporting these workers in their struggle for austerity. And most of all, importantly, offering them a political programme that offers real, genuine change. And that has to be a bold alternative, a genuine alternative to Tory cuts, which has to be a socialist programme uh, to end this crisis once and for all. don't guarantee uh, election victories. And, and I actually think uh, that, uh, that, that the, the battle we're having today is not about reform versus revolution at all. Um, global, uh, ending capitalism is actually not going to be on the, uh, in the manifestos of any party, any major party for the next election. By the way, they're not gonna, it's not going to be uh, on, in the manifestos of some parties to the left of Labour either. I mean, I actually regard, I don't know whether Matthew would agree with me, but I actually regard uh, both uh, respect uh, to the extent that it still exists and uh, left unity as uh, social democratic parties. They present social democratic programs in many respects. That's what I, that, they're not revolutionary parties, they're social democratic parties. They'll have programs which Matthew might agree with, and, and indeed they'll have programs, some of which I might agree with, but actually I'll agree with quite a lot. Um, and the, the battle we've actually got to defend, which is a really fundamental battle, is to defend the welfare state, to defend uh, social democratic values, because we're actually, you know, I, I entirely agree with Adam about the severity 
of uh, the economic crisis. Uh, I don't think any of us expected to come at, I mean, there are some people who always predicted, but uh, I don't think any of us expected it to be as severe as it was when it came. Certainly, New Labour politicians did not expect it. Uh, and, uh, and I think they still underestimate the longevity of the crisis uh, and uh, what we will have to do uh, in response. Um, I'm just as opposed as Adam is to the folly of austerity. I do think that, uh, you know, I'm deeply uh, troubled by uh, what I see as the timidity of uh, Ed Miliband, of the policies that Ed Miliband and his front bench have advanced. Um, I don't think they're remotely adequate uh, to deal with the crisis. And that is an ongoing argument we will have to have within the Labour movement about, about uh, policy, uh, you know, up to the next election and afterwards if we win it. But um, we need to defend social democracy uh, against neoliberalism now. You know, we need to make arguments about class being the main drivers of inequality and social division in this society. And I think we need to defend the role of the state, and indeed an expanding role of the state, to deal with the severity of the crisis, including public ownership, which I entirely agree with Adam in respect of uh, railways, uh, of, of, of some of the utilities, of Royal Mail, I think there's a lot of public support for. But the debate that we're having in the Labour Party at the moment, which is the one I really want to focus on, is, I see, as being an incredibly fundamental one about party reform. Now, you might see this as being an inward-looking debate, uh, but in, in my view, it's actually one of the most fundamental uh, debates about the future direction of the party that we've had since the early 1980s. And actually today, Unite, our biggest trade union, took a decision to back the college report. I don't know if people are aware of that. Now, which I think is the decisive uh, blow uh, against, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the sorts of things which I'm looking for. Uh, and it's a self-inflicted one by all the trade unions. Ed Miliband is going to go to the special conference on the 1st of March and have the overwhelming support of the trade unions. It's not a decisive blow. Uh, it, it may not prove to be decisive, but I certainly hope it won't. But it is a fundamental, you know, this has been a debate about the class orientation of the party. About, um, you know, the new Labour uh, diverted, la uh, diverted the Labour Party from its historic direction. It, it weakened uh, the loyalty and support of the trade union movement and working class people for the Labour Party. And, and, and that is uh, really what I want to talk about. Um, now, some might say, and I've said it myself, that this, this debate about party reform is in some ways a distraction from attacks on the poor and disabled people, on migrants, or other uh, uh, oppressed people. And, um, and against the disastrous folly of austerity and so on. Um, but uh, I would argue that protest against these things is fundamentally important. Who was it who said, I'm going to give you a quote, we began as a party of protest, we must never lose that, never forget it. There are many ills and many evils in the condition of our society that still have to be remedied. That was actually said by Jim Keller at the Labour Party Conference in 1976, not some radical And I think it's true. And I think that um, protest against things to which we're fundamentally opposed, <coughs> the expression of our principles and ideology may not have been part of the Blairite toolkit, but it seems to me that public animosity towards politicians and politics has much to do with the absence of those things and the failure by the Labour Party to <coughs> make clear what its principles and values are. So, um, this debate is about, this debate about party reform in the Labour Party at the moment is about where we stand, what's our direction of travel, what's our relationship to the working class and to the politics of class. Now, Tony Blair in 1999 famously said that, to the Labour Party conference again, that the class war is over. 
At the time, many would have agreed with that. Uh, the Labour movement was in an incredibly weak state. There had been massive defeats of, you know, in the minor strike, in many other disputes. Uh, membership had been eroded. 18 years of Tory rule had resulted in waves of anti-union legislation, in the destruction of traditional, of traditional industries where trade union membership was at its strongest. And yet it was combined um, uh, at the end with a period of rising living, uh, rising living standards. Um, though combined, and this went on through the new Labour years, with increasing inequality. Now, I don't think we should overstate the, 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 the support that Blair had uh, when he won his admittedly dramatic victory in uh, 1997. Because actually, what he got was 30.9%. He got the votes of 30.9% of the electorate, which was less than Labour had got in every post-war election until 1974. Every single one, including all the ones we lost in 1970, you know, to Macmillan and, and the Tories in the 50s, every single one we got more votes from the electorate than Tony Blair got. By 2005, Blair's vote had sunk to 21.6% of the electorate, which is actually less than every single election that Labour has fought since 1919, apart from 1983, the longest suicide but of course, by 2010, we managed to sink below that too, to 18.9%. And that was an election result which actually turned out to be rather better than we thought uh, in, in, in the months before it. So, um, and yet, so, so Blair radically changed the orientation of the Labour Party, and yet, in, in well, throughout the period, right, and, I, mean, I think you should remember, right up until the arrival of Blair, there was a very clear commitment of Labour to a working class base, that was never controversial, to, that there was a shared loyalty and commitment to the Labour movement. Um, now we can't even use the phrase Labour movement. These things apply just as much to Wilson and Callaghan, in spite of the, the battles that they fought with trade unions during uh, our debates about in place of strife in the 60s, about the social contract and the winter of discontent in the 70s. In spite of those things, Wilson and Callaghan still very much shared the, the, that loyalty and commitment to the Labour movement and those shared Labour values. Even in 1992, John Smith, uh, in my view, shared that. Uh, those values and that commitment. He was sponsored by the GMB, never missed a, uh, a GMB conference. He had broader support in the leadership election in 1992 than Ed Miliband had in, in, in 2010. Um, he, uh, he, and yet he was also the last trade union backed uh, Labour leader elected who then went on to fundamentally attack the relationship between the party and the trade union. In his case, it was, uh, it was a, a, about block votes, about the introduction of overview and selections, and about the proportion of votes at conference. He won it by a trick, by the trick of including all women in the shortlist, which many unions were supportive of by then, in a package, which he put as a single package for a single vote. And yet he won it on a knife edge. And yet, it seems to me that the relationship between trade unions and the Labour Party were rather better then, in, in 1993, than they are, uh, they, they are under, under Ed Miliband. Why is that? Well, first of all, John Smith was elected leader after 13 years of Tory rule. Ed Miliband was, was elected after 13 years of New Labour. And that was the, was the backdrop drop against which the trade unions formed their opinion of, of, of those people. Um, trade unions, for John Smith, were part of the solution as well as part of the problem. I'm not sure that applies to Ed Miliband, and I'm not sure that he has the same shared values as uh, John Smith. What Blair did, and what New Labour did uh, during its period of office, was to redefine itself, redefine the Labour Party as being close to business, and by business it meant not workers and 
trade unionists, but managers and owners. And the values of, of solidarity and community and social welfare were, welfare were replaced with market freedoms, uh, low taxation, labor market flexibility. Blair promised us that the class, or stated that the class war was over. In that speech, he promised fairness, not failures for the trade unions. The trade unions were just another pressure. There was no special relationship with the trade unions for Blair. And so what the trade unions got was no change in the legislation that had, that had made life so difficult for them, um, quite unreasonably in, in many ways. Uh, they got no partnership in government, they got no partnership in business, they got no partnership in the process of redistribution of, in, of income and power in the world. Um, the, even the good things that they got in my view, like the minimum wage, like uh, the significant increase uh, in public spending, were not so much the product of Blair's endeavours, but the product of John Smith, the, the, the heritage from John Smith, and to, to a lesser extent, the, the work of Gordon Brown, with, with whom I think there was some distinction from um, Blair. The sort of reform that they got, public service reform, was, uh, a, a, was actually uh, a new model of service for privatisation, marketisation, and the erosion of uh, relative pay and conditions. The, 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 the fact that a new Labour was intensely relaxed about the filthy rich made it clear who they were closer to. And the electorate responded. Now, that's why we got 18.9% of the votes in 2010. The, 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 the trade unionists, the working class voters, didn't abandon Labour by and large for the Tories. They abandoned politics. They abstained. But in many cases, where there were alternatives like the SNP, like Flies, and now, now like UKIP, they've gone to the rather than to the Tories. And so, where does Ed Miliband stand on these things? It seems to me that he, he has distanced himself from New Labour. He has acknowledged New Labour mistakes. Uh, there is some evidence of return to social democratic values, as, as, as Adam implied. Um, he does seem to want to re restore. Uh, to, 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 to recruit working class members. He does want to change the nature of the PLP, which is now overwhelmingly middle class. If the number of uh, bad carriers and people who worked in politics uh, you know, in the population was reflected in the House of Commons, sorry, it was reflected that, 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 that there are in the House of Commons were reflected in the population, there'd be six million spats uh, in the population, which is, you know, there isn't. Uh, not nearly. Uh, and so, uh, and I think Ed also sees class as a major determinant of social division and equity. But he, what he doesn't appear to see is any role for trading in the redistribution of power and wealth and in, com in combating uh, the uh, disastrous drop in, in the cost of being, in stance of being, in the right and cost of living. So, that's why uh, we. That is why, in my view, we could be about to confirm New Labour's turn away from the working class. Um, do. Sorry, let me just. Okay. Um, is that. I can't read my own Right. Did he want to do that? Is it something he planned to do? The thing that Blair didn't have the bottle to do, I think not. I think it was much more cocker in the wake of the of, of the Falker fiasco. It was based on ill advice from his advice from, from the people around him, and it was the result of pressure from progress. Is the Collins report right to advocate uh, what it's doing, the distancing, further distancing of trade unions from the area party? I think not. Trade unions bring working, a, a working class base, base to the party. They bring working class views and attitudes to the policy making table if, the, if, if, if Ed allows them to. And it's the only way that uh, we can ensure that there are working class MPs. But it could be worse. Um, the trade unions do still retain 50% of the voter conference, and um, you know, in many ways, what, what's in the Commons report is a classic fudge. So, is now the time for a decisive reorientation towards the working class? I'd argue yes. Electorally, Blair was fighting for Tory voters. 
Uh, Miliband is fighting for working class abstainers and doubters, uh, and, and to rebuild uh, and to retain radical uh, middle class work, uh, uh, mi the middle classes, radical middle classes. And Cameron is even worse off. In economic terms, um, <coughs> the, um, the economic crisis has changed any, everything. As Adam said, it's not going away, and trade unions are a vital defense for people in their workplaces uh, to defend their cost of living. Um, and as far as public attitudes are concerned, class is again very much on the agenda, thanks to uh, the uh, work of, uh, of, of the Occupy movement, you know, the, the, the idea that 1%, that, that, that the rich are getting a grossly unfair deal, uh, that the squeezed middle are suffering, is widespread. So, um, what remains to be seen is how effective Collins' measures will be and whether we will be able to restore uh, the democracy to the party which Blair did succeed in eroding so badly. And I think, you know, although obviously his conclusion 
uh, was different in terms of the type of politics, I think what he was was one of the sort of first people on the left to sort of really identify that actually the cultural changes in society that we saw were real and had to change the way in which we did our politics as well. Now, I'll probably start by spending a minute or two on sort of labels here, because obviously I, you know, we've talked about New Labour and we'll use other names later on. I mean, I think if we look at politics in the 1990s, we saw the rise first of the New Democrats, uh, led by Bill Clinton in the States, New Labour in the UK, and there was what was called Die Neue Mitte, which was Gerhard Schroeder's movement for the SPD in Germany. All three of those uh, parties, all three of those changes led by those leaders, meant that those parties won elections after significant periods of a dozen or more years in the wilderness during the, during the preceding years. So this was the sort of politics of the third way, the centre left, the progressives, whatever you want to call it, and over time, which obviously in the UK became known as Blairism. Um, and there's no doubt, more often than not, that if you are at a Labour Party meeting today, <coughs> that the term Blairite is a pejorative one. Um, I, mean, I think John sort of alluded to this, shall we say, in his sort of remarks, indicating something that you know, it's not sitting within the traditions of the Labour Party. It is a blip to be dismissed, you know, with no positive lessons for today. Now, it's true that the Blairite period broke with one Labour tradition, and that was the tradition of losing. You know, and I think that is one of the things that I just want to sort of focus on in terms of my remarks. You know, yes, you can say that the Labour Party got fewer votes, in the 1997 and the 2001 election and the previous elections. But the fundamental difference was it won in 1997, in 2001, and in 2005. And, you know, let's just remind ourselves that this was the first time in the party's history that it secured two full terms of government, let alone three. But my argument tonight uh, is that the lessons behind that win are as important today as they were in delivering those victories. And to repeat that success in the future lies in understanding and embracing the fundamentals of New Labour's political approach. So why has, it become, has Blairite become so fashionable you know, as, a, as a term of abuse? And what is the sort of supposed threat that they kind of represent? Well, recently uh, the independent columnist Steve Richards said that you only need, quote, you only need to think for 10 seconds to realise that Blairites don't exist. Well, this will come obviously as good news to the likes of Len McCluskey, who seemed determined to keep alive some McCarthyite like fear of modernisers under the bed about to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory for Ed Miliband. But as someone who worked for Tony Blair, you might be surprised to learn that I also think that the term Blairite is as outdated as the sort of brick pop era that spawned it. The reason I don't like the term Blairite is that it implies a successful Labour government delivering real progressive change whilst keeping the broad coalition of the electorate with it can only be delivered by Tony Blair. Now, in the past four decades of Labour history, it might only be Tony Blair who has won an election and the power to deliver for voters that goes with it. But my point is it doesn't have to be. Anyone who admires Tony Blair wants it to be a new generation succeeds in building on his record of the recent past. Those of us who were Blairite are the last ones who should be harking back to past glories, but using what we learned from that period to deliver future success for our party. And that's what I believe makes Blairite such an anachronistic term. But while the term may belong to the past, what it stands for, I would argue, is more relevant than ever. Take a subject like public service reform. It wasn't sounding like the title of a term course here at Cambridge that resonated with voters. Instead, it was the fact that much of the electorate felt that they could trust Labour because they knew that Tony Blair instinctively looked at everything through the eye, lens of the parent, the pupil, or the patient, i.e. them, not the producer. And look at what Labour is saying today. Ed Miliband on Monday was giving a speech on public service reform and the importance of it. John Crellis followed his output speech on Wednesday at the New Local <coughs> Network. 
the policies that are trying to be focused, whether it's on energy prices uh, or whatever, are the ones that reflect that essential of being on your side. So New Labour may have lasted longer and been more popular as a brand than previous brands that have been. But what we do need to do, and this is where I would sort of agree with John, is that we need to look again at the language of New Labour. But the dilemma for people like me is we don't have a word, but we do have a goal. You call it what you like, the Labour Party still needs to embrace the political approach that won us those elections. Part of Paul Richard's critique was that uh, Tony Blair's own ideas and arguments have evolved over time, as he wrote, so the quote, even Tony Blair isn't a Blairer. But this is to miss the point entirely. Of course the policies that were advocated by the Labour Party at the 2005 election were different to the ones advocated in 1997, just as the policies today are different again. So for example, just as in 1997, we had to make a case for a minimum wage at all, I would argue it is entirely consistent to now be in a position where we think that we should be arguing in favour of a living wage at this stage and, and having, a, having that as a policy. And I do not see those things as being inconsistent. Philip Gould, in his must-read memoir, The Unfinished Revolution, couldn't have been clearer. Being New Labour isn't about looking back, but about constantly looking forward, questioning the status quo, and wanting to go further in delivering progressive change. So, I would describe a Blairite as someone who wants the Labour Party to win elections rather than lose them. Now, surely everyone agrees with that, you would say. But this is what I think it means in terms of the politics and the political approach. The crucial difference is entirely about whether you think the Labour Party used to lose elections because of a fault with the electorate or a fault with ourselves. You know, one of the favourite quotes that used to be quoted to me was, was, a, was a Labour frontbencher who was talking to, to a party member after the 1992 election. And the, the party member said, the public have rejected us three times in a row now. What's wrong with them? You know, if we want to be true to our values, we have to be in government to deliver them. You know, winning elections isn't something we should be embarrassed about. In a democracy, it is a necessary function of delivering of what you believe. It is not a betrayal of our values to want to win and therefore to listen to where the public are and react accordingly. Not pandering on issues such as Europe and immigration, as the Blue Labour thesis goes. And frankly, I'm, you know, I'm not happy with some of the stuff that, we, that the party has been saying recently on immigration. I think it's totally misdiagnosed problem. We can't promise what we can't deliver, otherwise that's how you end up with the nonsense of pledges like British jobs for British workers. But winning does mean we're bringing new voters into the fold. If you look at the basic maths, we know there aren't enough lifelong Labour voters to deliver an election victory. If we look at our low watermarks of either 1983 or 2010, the party polled 28 29% respectively. By contrast, the, low, the, the Tories' low water mark is 32 and 33% respectively, if you look at their worst elections. So the Labour Party will only win when it wins the voters of those who don't normally identify as being Labour. We can't rely on a core vote, on only talking to the converted, the very people who have so far only ever voted Labour when you know the very, the very people you know, have, who have so far voted Labour are the ones that we, we need to build on to win again. Now, since 2010, I think we've made bright strides in this. We've won back some of the votes that we lost to the Liberal Democrats. But let's be clear on the maths of this. Um, John referred to the 5 million lost votes. It's true, there were 13.5 million people who voted Labour in 1997. Now, you know, when we talk about votes were lost, by 2010, 3.5 million of those were dead. So, you know, kind of, that sort of affects the way, you know, there's not, not much we can do about those. But of the remaining 10 million, basically we lost 4 million, of which uh, 2 million went to the Liberal Democrats, 1.6 million went to um, uh, the Conservatives, and the other 0.4 million uh, abstained. 
So therefore, if we want to get back to a situation where you know we are getting those sort of poll numbers that we were getting in 1997, and let's not forget, you know, that vote in 1997 was, you know, those voters came back to the Labour Party in 1997. If you look at, you know, when we had left wing manifestos in 1983 uh, or 87, you know, it wasn't that it was the C2DZs that were voting for us. You know, in 1983, and we were purely being de defeated by the votes of the ABs. You know, we were losing. We were losing in all of the key demographics of the world. You know, with, whether you look at the 1983 manifesto across any class divide. But my point is that unless the party becomes relaxed about the fact that we need to persuade people who have, at some point in their life, voted Conservative to join, to vote with, to join us, then we are doomed to lose. Why does this matter? Because Labour's success depends on recognising that while over time the people change, the policies change, the fundamental principles of how a party of the centre left wins doesn't change. A party of the centre left can only win an election in Britain from the centre ground, with a coalition that runs from the north and the south that isn't defined by class. And let me just say one thing on the final point. In 1997, there were two million more people who identified as working class rather than as middle class. You know, today there are six million more people who are of middle class than the working class. You cannot ignore the sorts of cultural changes, the societal changes that Stuart Hall talked about talk about back in the 1980s, and that are a reality of the economy today. But you have six million more middle class voters than you do working class voters. You know, and you have you therefore have to build a coalition that is willing to work with business deliver real change. This is the political agenda that became the finest flare up. The battle isn't on being personal defenders of Tony Blair or his record, although I believe there's plenty we should be proud of in that. The far more important thing is recognising the political folly of moving on from Blairism in, with, with, in terms of looking at it as personally a thing to do with Tony Blair. It's a state of mind, not a moment in time or a personal fan club, or even a world. Only then is beyond the available and embracing the spirit in today's generation of these leaders, hope to emulate the success of a man whose name I don't need to mention again. So maybe we need a new label, and I think we could do a lot worse than try with